thank you very much um, to the organizers of this wonderful conference and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. I'll have to begin my talk with a little caveat because what I'm presenting today um, is not going to be a traditional academic talk. I will tell you something about my a uh, new research project which, uh, as you heard, uh, deals with the modern notion of everyday life. But the whole thing is going to be framed by a uh, personal anecdote, by something that uh, happened to me which was too intriguing to not share with you and too much of a coincidence to not somehow connect it to uh, what I'm going to be talking about. And I hope to show you that it's not so disconnected from the first thing after all. All right, just give me a second. I'm really sorry. I, and I wanted to say it's the first time that I'm working with PowerPoint, so. <laughs> yes, there it is. All right. So bear with me uh, for what I can only describe as a somewhat dramatized story or an experiment. My story begins with coincidence and the unreliability of memory. It's about a couple of pictures that found me rather than me finding them. Sometime earlier this year, me and my partner spent some time in a room of her apartment that we normally don't use together, her study and guest room. I was reading and she was rearranging some things in the room when she came upon some loosely small formatted pictures tucked in between letters, postcards, invoices and flyers all assembled in an antique looking paper holder that I had given her as a present. The paper holder functioned as something of a mnemonic device, I'm sorry, mnemonic device, an object to structure memory. Every year it gets cleaned out. Uh, payroll information sheets move into folders, flyers of parties are thrown away or collected somewhere else. Things get thrown away. Only these pictures, which she had never shown me before, stayed where they were year after year. My partner had not forgotten about the photographs. About once a year, she says she looked at them, but only now, for some reason, she handed them to me. All in all, there were 33 pictures, uh, the largest 6 by 9 centimeters, the smallest 6 by 6 centimeters in size. The origins, or what they depicted, were murky, to say the least. She never knew what to do with them, which is why they stayed in the paper holder. It was a mystery to my partner how exactly the pictures had ended up in her possession. Everything about them, the size, the coloring, and most of all what they showed, made them belong to the past, but she was sure that they were not hers nor her family's. To the best of her memory, she had found the pictures in the collective trash at her grandmother's multi-level apartment building in Berlin Tiergarten. And here begins a little story that connects to our topic yesterday, the Mosserstadt or Mosses Berlin. Her grandmother had neither always lived in West Berlin, nor she, was she my partner's grandmother in the biological sense. For many years, she had an apartment in East Berlin, in the same house as my partner's parents, who befriended her, had her watch the kids, and in turn, helped her out in her daily life. No one exactly knows when the kids started to call her Oma, but that is how she was referred to. Due to a part of her family living in West Berlin, she was eventually allowed to move, providing her social grandchildren with a rare and fascinating possibility to go to the West every once in a while. As far as my partner can remember, it was there at the apartment building in Tiergarten, in the patio where the garbage bins for the whole house were standing, attentively suggesting to separate your trash into paper, waste, and plastic, that she one day found the pictures in the paper bin, which she then took home and kept in the aforementioned paper holder. Looking at the pictures printed on German photo paper, we see snapshots taken in what seems to be a children's hospital or an orphanage, depicting, most of all, ordinary, everyday life activities in a professional setting. Doctors and nurses holding children, kids or babies in their rooms and in their cots. Some pictures, however, seem to be taken on special occasions, the built-in moments of exception in modern everyday life, like the holiday or the party. 
The frame and the distances are varying. Some pictures are taken from up close, with the photographer cowering as if to adapt the perspective of the child. Others are taken standing. Most likely, these pictures were not intended as art, as indicated by the recurrent appearance of certain people, fuzziness, and the overall composition. And it would be the discussion for another talk to uh, think about what that statement means, that is, whether something has to be intended as art in order to be viewed as art. Sometimes, however, there is a certain artwork-like aesthetic quality to the pictures. Take this one on the left where the nurse is located on the far left side of an otherwise empty room with a dark interior almost resisting the gleaming light that shines through the window, or the one on the right where the row of children's beds as well as the almost pre-arranged children themselves seem to flee into the back left corner of the picture, again dominated by the light that falls into the window. In fact, we are sometimes reminded of categories that were developed for unequivocal works of art, some pictures, uh, for instance, as many snapshots of everyday life do, the pictures oscillate between what Michael Fried calls absorption and theatricality. In some, the people are very aware of being watched and photograph, photographed, smiling at the camera, and thus entering into a relationship with the viewers that Fried describes as theatrical. Others, however, in others, however, the subjects of the photograph seem unknowing of the eye of the camera, absorbed in whatever they are doing, with the picture immediately moving closer to a work of art, separating itself from the world, asserting its autonomy. By all accounts, these are innocuous pictures, snapshots from an everyday life, which all in all looks rather innocent, happy, and relaxed. There was one picture, however, which struck me as having a darker, almost unsettling atmosphere and a much different composition. Here, we have a little pathway leading into the back of the photograph, crossed by another path, creating something of a symmetry, underscored by the two trees on either side. A woman figure is curiously standing in the center, as if she stopped to think, is waiting or is looking at something, with another woman walking away from the spectator, raising the question whether there's any relation between the two. There is snow, the weather seems to be uncomfortable, with the leafless trees blocking the view of the surrounding buildings, which we therefore cannot quite discern. If we had to guess when these pictures were taken, we'd most likely point roughly to the first half of the 20th century when color photography was still rather unusual and picture prints smaller in size than today. <coughs> Excuse me. The suggestive gray, the clothing, the interior, and the few buildings that we see here and there might make us think of the 1940s or 1950s. And we'd be correct. A couple of notes on the back of some of the pictures indicate that they were taken in 1950, 1951, 1953, and 1955. And it is here that our historical sensibilities might become moved or agitated, even suspicious, of the peacefulness and innocuousness of the pictures. Suspicion of the false surface of civility and normalcy. That was the program of a book published right around the time when the pictures were taken, in which children, nurses, doctors, and trees all make an appearance. Theodore Viadorno's 1951 Minima Moralia, these elegantly written, densely composed aphorisms, was a huge success. This success, as its author wrote to Siegfried Krakauer, was facilitated by the existence of an intellectual and political vacuum in which the book, and this is a strange phrase, could make itself a home. It is curious how the book managed to do that, to a large degree, its audience were still the old subjects living under new conditions that only a couple of years ago they had not wanted. And Minima Moralia had at its core precisely this question, which was both particular to Adorno's situation and universal regarding society as a whole. How to continue living after what had happened, how to deal with the catastrophe that was the National Socialist regime and the destruction of the Jews. 
There is one aphorism which not only tackles this question directly, but that also speaks to the topic of my research in this talk, the notion of everyday life. In addition, it features prominently one of the aforementioned elements of the pictures, namely the trees. How nice of you, doctor, is the curious title of the fifth aphorism in Minima Moralia, which might have rung a bell for a German audience back then, but was certainly not familiar to the English or American readers, which is why the English translation informs us about the origins of the phrase, which the German version doesn't. It is a reference to Goethe's Faust, where a peasant utters the following words to the protagonist, and most English versions actually translate it differently, but the quote goes, Doctor, it is good of you today not to shun the crowd, so that among the folk at play the learned man walks about. The quote anticipates what the end of the aphorism inverts in a familiar negative gesture, namely that for the intellectual, quote, isolation is now the only way of showing some measure of solidarity. All collaboration, all the human worth of social mixing and participation merely masks a tacit acceptance of inhumanity, end of quote. But I want to focus on something else that is at stake in the aphorism, something that is condensed in the first sentence. There is nothing innocuous left. The ones innocuous, we learn, are the harmless, innocent, almost unconscious gestures and actions of everyday life, a special stratum of the everyday, if you will. As Adorno says in the second sentence, the little pleasures, expressions of life that seemed exempt from the responsibility of thought, not only have an element of defiant silliness, of callous refusal to see, but directly serve their diametrical opposite. In the later passages, we find examples of these little pleasures. There is the visit to the cinema, which Adorno famously says leaves him stupider and worse. And the famous line about the chance conversation on the train, where one concedes certain statements in order to avoid dispute, statements that ultimately implicate murder. Sociability, Umgänglichkeit, Uninhibitedness, Unbefangenheit, which the English version unfortunately translates as spontaneity, Ease, Behagen, being leger, um, wrongly translated as impetuosity, letting oneself go, sich gehen lassen, or affability, Leutseligkeit. These are the words that Adorno uses to circumscribe, circumscribe this particular mode of interaction, communication, among people in everyday life, which for him has become increasingly problematic, shallow, and even wrong. There is one famous phrase that contains the whole movement of thought of the aphorism. It says, even the blossoming tree lies the moment its bloom is seen without the shadow of terror. Even the innocent, how lovely, becomes an excuse for an existence outrageously unlovely and there is no longer beauty or consolation except in the gaze falling on horror, withstanding it, and in unalleviated consciousness of negativity, holding fast to the possibility of what is better. This is again a description of how Adorno demands the critical perspective to be, what he calls the consciousness of negativity. But then there's the curiously placed tree at the beginning of the sentence. In the context of the aphorism, the tree is something of an anomaly. All other references are of a social quality, while the tree is an object from nature. The concept of nature, of course, as you probably know, plays an important role for Adorno, understood as the material foundation that enlightenment has to conquer and the somatic which thought can't quite get away from. We are specifically reminded of the role that the Kantian notion of natural beauty plays for Adorno's aesthetic. Moreover, since the interaction with the tree in the aphorism seems to be the act of looking at it and admiring its beauty, with the tree, which would normally be devoid of concept and consciousness, taking on a person status, a person-like status, capable of lying. Adorno takes a metaphor for nature and an act of innocent pleasure and juxtaposes it with the unseen horror that had already happened when he wrote the aphorism, which most likely um, was written between 44 and 47. Adorno was certainly very aware of the highly symbolic object he had used, the tree being nothing less than a literary universal. This is easily proven by a number of examples. 
The most obvious, and the one that Adorno might actually have been familiar with, is Bertolt Brecht's An die Nachgeborenen, To Those Born Later or To Posteriority, which was written between 1934 and 38, published in 39, while Brecht was in exile in Denmark. The poem, which begins with the line, truly I live in dark times, is probably most famous for the following passage, which echoes the beginning of the poem. What kind of times are these when to talk about trees is almost a crime because it applies silence about so many horrors? Similarly to Adorno's aphorism, the poem then unpacks the scandal that it is alluding to by setting up a counterimage of normalcy, again evoking fragments of everyday life. Brecht speaks of still earning his bread, eating and drinking, and of the man who laughs. He also adds something like a tongue-in-cheek rem remark about him having, quote, little patience for nature's beauty during the, uh, during the times of political upheaval preceding National Socialism. And as you probably know, his understanding of political and artistical commitment could not be further from a Kantian notion of natural beauty. It is also something like an inverted foreshadowing of how Adorno will use the idea of natural beauty to contrast with the horrors of National Socialism. For Adorno, the innocence that the remark how lovely about a tree conveys is lost with the advent of the Nazis. But for Brecht, this idea had always been fraught. Only now, in exile, the pleasures and beauty of nature's attained for Brecht a somewhat changed quality as something that can only be appreciated when the times are the darkest. Brecht's line about the trees has since taken on a life of its own. Think of Paul Celan's 1968 response, a, tr a leaf treeless and blood boundless, dedicated to Bertolt Brecht, where the tree has vanished and the force of the poem is concentrated on the language itself. We could also look to Erich Fried's 1967 talk about trees, Gepräche über Bäume, in which seemingly random notes about the garden, the kids, and the house of the narrator are interrupted by single line insertion of statements about Vietnam. Or we could point to a more subtle reference that emerges in the opening chapter of Roches and Bruns, 1980, What a Beautiful Sunday. Here, the narrative voice of the chapter titled Zero describes how the protagonist sluggishly walks through the snowy eternity after having heard a noise somewhere when he suddenly sees a tree. He stops and is fascinated by the beauty of the tree and nothing else. The snow-covered tree then turns into something of an opening in the fabric of time, relativizing in its momentary grandeur the lifetime of the individual. He laughed at the sun, the novel says, at the tree, at the landscape of the idea of his own probable, pitiful absence. The reason why a tree could suddenly attain such an aesthetic significance is, of course, revealed only moments later, when the still nameless protagonist is interrupted by an SS soldier who holds him at gunpoint. The protagonist points at the tree and says, the tree, a beautiful tree. For a couple of moments, they stand in front of the tree together, and what the protagonist is actually imagining during those minutes is what is foreclosed in Adorno and Brecht, a talk about the tree. But it remains an, uh, only an imagination. The moment passes and innocence, as the book says, remains a faint possibility. After all, we are in the outskirts of the concentration camp Buchenwald. The protagonist is inmate number 44904, and the smoke, referenced in passing just moments before, turns out to be the smoke of the crematorium. In all of the examples, the tree is a symbol of something lost, a symbol for lost normalcy, a stand-in for the everyday, we can say. And the concentration camp is probably the most clearing example of the abolishment of everyday life, even as it restages the everyday by means of routine and habit. But the dissolution of the everyday was already part and parcel to National Socialism itself, as we can learn in, George, uh, in, in, anthology, in a 1966 anthology edited by George Marcy, Nazi Culture, which in German was translated as Der Nationalsozialistische Alltag, so lebt man unter Hitler. 
Through countless original documents, as well as in his introduction, Moss strongly states that National Socialism operated by infusing everyday life with politics, eventually breaking down everyday life, breaking down the barriers between public, political, and private. Family life, sexual politics, music, literature, it was all subjugated to the National Socialist ideology. Even minor details of everyday life, like the five o'clock tree, to just name one of the examples that pop up in the anthology, turned are turned into a political question on which the fate of the German race depended. A simple return to normalcy, a recuperation of li everyday life, if you will, was for Massey as impossible as it was for Adorno. With this in mind, let's return to the pictures with which I began my talk. How do we look at them now? Are we still convinced by their innocuous everydayness? Do the photographs of doctors and nurses, well in the age of having lived in Hitler's Germany, retain the innocence that they might have evoked at the beginning? Do we see the women passing each other by on that avenue between the trees differently than we have before? Do we think about the history of the children in their carts? Do we maybe wonder about the history of the place at all? and whether the trees in the picture, metaphorically speaking, are blocking more than the light. These are, as you might suspect, somewhat leading questions. In fact, a couple of photographs did have some more notes on the back, about which I have kept you in the dark until now. And they reveal where most of them were taken. And in our context, this place isn't like any other, and its particular history inserts precisely the fragility, fragility and questionability into the idea of the everyday that Adorno evokes in his aphorism. It is a place in Berlin that we heard about briefly yesterday. Located between Schmargendorf and Wilmersdorf, built between 1893 and 1895. When it was open, uh, opened in 1895 as an orphanage, it also got a proper name. Mossische Erziehungsanstalt für Knaben und Mädchen. Or, as the shorthand goes, Mosserstift. So this is one of the pictures um, from this collection that found me. According to the mission statement of the foundation that the Mosser family created in 1908 to run the place, the orphanage was intended specifically to help children from the learned classes, that is the increasingly suffering middle class no matter their religious background. In 1922, under the pressure of inflation, the family could not finance the orphanage anymore and don donated it to the city of Berlin, under the condition that the name of the founder was kept. The city complied. In the late 1920s, the building was reconstructed and turned into a hostel for apprentices and children, a Lehrlings- and Säuglingswohnheim, but it didn't remain the Mosserstift for long. The Nazis erased the name of the Mosse family, which makes it even more striking that it said Mosse Stift on the back of the pictures from the 1950s. Starting in 1936, the Nazis used the building as a children's hospital, which it essentially remained until the 1970s, after which it underwent more construction, housing now multiple operations. Two plaques, one of which was put there in 1989, commemorate the Massa family who created the building, which still exists today. And you can read much more about the building in Elizabeth Krauss's book about the Massas in Berlin. Let me end by conveying not just my bafflement about this coincidence and the peculiar, as I hope to have shown, interlocking with my talk's topic, but also let me end with the first four lines of another poem that features trees. It's What Times Are These by Adrian Rich, which is a more recent answer to Bertolt Brecht, which I think puts the darkness surrounding this picture in a very eerie and appropriate context. There is a place between two stands of trees where the grass grows uphill, and the old revolutionary road breaks off into shadows, near a meeting house abandoned by the persecuted who disappeared into those shadows. Thank you.